We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. If you've got a specific guest or topic you want us to cover on the upcoming shows, submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests. We uh, review those every week here at Security Weekly, and we'll get back to you. So there's also a Discord channel for guest suggestions as well, and you can find an invite to our Discord channel at securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, where you can also subscribe to all of our shows. I am here with none other than Josh Corman. Hello, friend. This is, this is kind of, it's, it's weird. So Josh and I just recorded a Hacker Heroes, and we, we, we did it very purposely that uh, we spent time on certain topics, which you'll hear in an upcoming Hacker Heroes episode, which we're, we're just about, you'll probably see the first episode start to hit next month. Um, and we've interviewed... Folks like Josh, Wendy Nather, and many others, Win Schwartow, um, and it's, I'm already pulling on on themes and kind of threads uh, throughout these interviews, which is amazing. But Josh, you're here today. You you are currently unemployed. Is that true? I am absolutely <laughs> and necessarily currently unemployed. Yes, I'm exhausted after what I just did. But you are here having cigars and scotch with me in studio which is amazing so life is good yes 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 i i have a i am thankful for my job because one of the things i get to do sit down with my friends and have cigars and scotch and talk shop and so so necessary for the soul to see you in person it is amazing to see you not not just like be but like conduct these interviews in person like certainly seeing you in person seeing other people's faces now that a lot of the mask mandates have lifted but see your friends faces again in person but uh, have the conversation sitting across the table from a guest is so refreshing. It's recharging my batteries. It really is. It doesn't hurt that I'm fond of you. And really good looking. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> He's like, That's true. He's like, Yeah, I know. But unlike the last time I saw you, I have a longer beard than you now. You do have a long my beard got to be pretty long, but then it just it doesn't look good. I have to keep it trimmed. Oh, mine never looks good. But no, yours looks amazing. It, it really does. It's, it's long. It's long. I have a lot more gray in my beard. Mm. I don't know how you pull it. Is I got, that dye I, or is I, that? I got more gray during Not as I, much as I mine. Just did. If I grow mine out, dude, like it's mostly gray. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's not quite Jack Daniel, but. And at 32, it's amazing that you would amazing. have that much gray. We established yeah. that we're, we're still yeah. 32. It's, yeah. it's amazing. And next year, we'll still be 32. We wanted to pick up the story. We mm. talked to Josh on Hacker Heroes. Everything pretty much right up to CISA. And basically, at this point in the story, uh, well, you went to work for CISA for, what, 18 months? I was in as a Fed for 18 months, but I got the call to serve five months prior. It just yeah, take, yep. even under so emergency. It probably took 18 months to get you in. It took five months. Five months, months okay. Uh, now, Kreb, Krebs, Krebs hired you? Yep. Um, where do you want to start? There. <laughs> there were people that didn't think that healthcare systems would be attacked. Right. Um, they were proven wrong. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, to, it's like that cut scene in the beginning of the movie that shows at the end of the movie. Mm. That's kind of the end of the movie. Yeah. So I, we should just come right out swinging. Um, I'll start with one of the big, big moments during the public service. Um, but then we'll back up to the beginning. Where, where'd you go day one? So Krebs hired, you convinced Krebs. No. He wanted to hire you. You had to convince him. Let's start there. We'll get there in a second. Okay. Uh, one of the cybersecurity relevant moments, mm -hmm. we definitely got to get to bad, bad practices and yeah, target yeah, yeah. rich cyber poor, but which wasn't so much pandemic related, but sure. came from it. One of the moments is, um, cause stunningly very few of our friends even saw this. Um, we published data science on October 1st on CISA government paper. That is the first statistical proof that ransomware killed people. We've heard this as hyperbole. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word for it? My it, command of the English language, I admit, is I do yeah. all these podcasts, right? Yeah. But I would, I would tag it as hyperbole because we hear about the woman 
in the UK, Germany, w- or Germany, right? They couldn't get to the hospital because the hospital was under ransomware attack. She had to be diverted and she died. We hear anecdotes. There's lots of ways to dismiss them. Anecdotes might be a better, yeah. a better phrase for that. But when or there's work. no named person, we say, well, no one's ever died. And when there's yeah, because we're kind of like, oh, that was a one off. Like, oh, maybe the person was going to die anyway. We don't have all the details. So and when you get a named person, they say, well, where's the that's a one off. Where's it's the statistical one-off. proof? Right. So on the very within days of us publishing, uh, the Wall Street Journal front page has the first lawsuit for a loss of life from a ransomware attack for mm-hmm. a, a baby in an Alabama hospital. Um. They're going to lose the hospital. Is this pre that or during that pre pandemic? It's pre pandemic. But so we have proof evidence. We have a case that's going to settle for sure. Okay. Um, that's evidence. people can still debate it. Sure. We have, we have a case that's going to settle because they essentially confessed in text messages to each other. Was that was the patient in the hospital or on route to the hospital? Like ransomware happened and then they went to the hospital. I don't know if you remember. I will. The details, I, will I do remember some. I'll do the short version. Mm-hmm. You should read the Wall Street Journal article mm-hmm. front page. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was late September. Um, the story, uh, the alleged, you know, wrongful doing here, and there'll be some policy that comes out of this too. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's tragic, and we should not. Um, yeah, we don't want. We should not be flippant with the story, but yeah, no, I, some people I have been. And I, I, yeah, I agree. And it upsets me, yeah. um, especially because part of what because we're talking yeah. cybersecurity yeah. and all that stuff and trying to yeah, but th- th- we don't want to. We don't want to take away from the impact and the like, weight of yeah. losing a child in this case, which is awful. Right. And uh, the loss of a, you and I talked about loss of parents on mm-hmm. the Heroes episode. Um, it's gutting. Um, but also so many, too many people have lost a, a child or a pregnancy and it's far too common, but it's yep. still horrible to go through. So I hope people show some respect as they discuss the story. Agreed. I know you will. So the, the, the vital summary of this is that pre-pandemic in Alabama, a hospital got hit by ransomware and they chose to remain functioning even though a lot of the IT systems were not. They admitted a woman. People say they go to paper and everything's fine. Obviously They, they, they say that, but yeah. the, the advancements in medicine have been enabled by technology and imaging. Agreed, and agreed. My wife works in yeah. medical imaging. Yeah. Yeah, she's a sonographer. So when you lack that imaging, a lot of the doctors we work with during my task force would say, like, you're essentially going back 15 plus years in your ability to... Or if you have that image, you can't get it to the right person. Yeah, and they couldn't even use a lot of the imaging. So Because they're, they're, what people don't realize maybe is their computers on wheels or computers that run these imaging equipment, right? the imaging equipment. Yeah. So a number of the systems in the hospital were diminished, mm-hmm. but they kept admitting patients, figuring they could just go back. They're all trained. They know how to do this before tech. But they shouldn't have maybe had as many people admitted when yeah. you can't scale as well, especially. Because if you don't have, so to be a sonographer, you, well, it used to be you had to be an x-ray technician in order to be admitted to a sonography program to, er, to earn that yeah. degree. And, yeah. d- and it varies per state. But in x-rays, I know my, you know my wife and I started dating in 2003, even back then, you, got a, you could get a physical film. There was no digital yeah. like you actually print like you had a film it was a film based uh x-ray machine in hospitals today yeah. the story we're referencing i bet those machines didn't exist i think the key here and i'm going to oversimplify but the key mm-hmm. is a number of technologies make it possible for fewer doctors and nurses to do more patients correct yeah it's in the absence well of it yeah yep. it's going to affect the, mm-hmm. the quality of care so this mother was admitted successfully gave birth but it turned out to be a complicated birth yep and dangerous birth it happens the baby did survive childbirth because doctors know how to deal with sure things but subsequently died and when the family was Ugh. looking into is there is there wrongful death the evidentiary collection has a f- several things they point to and they're suing you know the hospital itself the doctors the nurses they're, su- they're suing a lot of people but the reason this is going to either settle or turn into policy is because there were ex- text exchanges between staff saying, had we merely had the imaging system, we never would have lost that, lost child. that child. And whether that's so true or not, those, yeah, those yeah, become essentially, it, it's, right. it's a case closed thing. Mm-hmm. Now, different people can look at who's to blame. And, and I, I, I often look at these as a shared responsibility and I care less about blame and more about learning. But you know, really good questions come up about informed consent. Like, should you have told 
the patients before admitting that, there was, that we're uh, having some diminished capacity. An might increased go. risk. Yeah. Should the patient be aware of the increased risk right, right. is the question. Right. Yeah. In, informed consent is a huge part of the profession. And right. so there are new yeah, styles be, of questions. But you have to make that decision before she gave birth in this case. Before you, even before the, I should say, before yeah. the patient is admitted, yeah. should you be disclosed that information? Arguably, you can imagine a future where hospitals are obligated to disclose that they have diminished capacity, obligated to have altered census is the term, census how many people mm -hmm. you admit when you're in a diminished capacity and should have informed consent. And if it's a especially high risk pregnancy or a high risk scenario, if should any, you be automatically be diverted? You should automatically go somewhere yeah. else. Those are risk. It's interesting. Yeah. When you tell people that aren't in our field and bring up the risk based decision, especially when we talk about the pandemic, they kind of dismiss like, oh, it's not a risk based decision. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like it totally like you then you don't understand the definition of risk, which not the fault people haven't worked in risk. It is a difficult thing to right. define. So I know the, these conversations will, meet, will go all over the place, but to do the direct co you know, contrast, as that story was mm -hmm. about to break, we were pretty close to publishing our own work, mm -hmm. independent, of, that was observed during the pandemic. This is when you were at CISA? At CISA. They, yeah. say, they say CISA. CISA, CISA. sorry. So, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the newest federal agency, a little over three years old. Um, and we'll get to how I got hired and what we did there. It was the one thing the Trump administration created in the name of cybersecurity. It was created by Congress. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. during his presidency, it was at yeah. least one of the few things. So, um, <laughs> by the way, yeah, we should have said this on the Heroes one, but um, boy, did we take some haters for choosing to go do public service to keep people alive during a pandemic. But I was called a Nazi a baby killer uh, because of who was because I was in the, the president federal government. At the time? Some hated the president in office. Some hated sure. the Department of Homeland Security, of which I had almost nothing to do with them. Because um, ICE CISA, and Border Patrol is separate from DHS. Let's just throw let's let's put some facts out there. Every agency lives somewhere, and CISA lives in the Department of Homeland Security. But just like oh yeah. okay yeah okay so it is so it is somewhere in there somewhere in that yeah. hierarchy. Yeah. But largely independent is what you're saying. It's an agency. Yeah. Okay. Um, the key here, b before we get into all that and how I got there, is there were emergency hiring authorities that were able to directly hire outside talent to make sure we had limited loss of life in cybersecurity and physical security for the pandemic. It was called the CARES Act Hiring Authority. Yes. Uh, but I'm going to truncate that to finish the story on the baby. Okay. So near within days of that front page story dropping um we were about to publish but we missed it but i, I did get quoted in the story because the wall street journal had been pre-briefed on our study but we independently during the pandemic had been studying the effects of ransomware on public safety human life and we had seen because right, that's not a pandemic thing so you, you know but it was like exaggerated what happened was the icu strain intensive care unit strain on hospitals was so high during the pandemic. And it was then, hard to study any effects of ransomware. You would not have been able to do the study we did had it not been for the pandemic. But we knew during the pandemic what hospital strain looked like and how to correlate it to quantifiable numbers of loss of life. Mm -hmm. And what we could see, oversimplified, this is what was in the Wall Street Journal, is we watched some of the, some of the victims of ransomware that had the most protracted downtime. Mm -hmm. And we watched one particular victim in state and in the same state with the same pandemic and the same population for a statistically significant observation period of five months, we were able to look at controlling for hospital type and size. Mm -hmm. We could see that hospitals hit by the ransoms achieved these excess death stress zones sooner and stayed there longer. So whoa, whoa, wait, I know I just said a lot. You said a lot because from a data perspective, hospitals, intensive care units, ICUs are under strain because of the pandemic right. there's there's more patients that are ending up in an icu right. how do you measure the effects of ransomware and your ability to treat patients when you also have a variable of an influx of patients due to a global pandemic right so given the the tide waters had risen for everyone mm -hmm. we were able to you directly compare yeah the delta so the, there's a lot of data science in it and you can read Did it all it? Yeah. Help is the wrong term here. Did it make it easier to study because there was already increased? It would not have been observable, but for the elevated strains of the pandemic. So does that mean ransomware doesn't 
put the strain on the ICUs in the same way, but makes it more measurable. I do this now or in a few minutes. Depends on what do you want to do. Let's do it now. Okay. Um, How do I recalibrate? Okay, so there's some data science in here, but I don't want to get data science wonky. We studied a lot of things in my... So Krebs had hired me to design and implement what became known as the CISA COVID task force. And I, there were several other CARES Act hires, massively multidisciplinary. Some were physicians, some were infectious disease experts, some were ICS hackers, mm-hmm. some were supply chain experts. We had a very large team of private sector people who took a pause to serve their country during an exogenous circumstance. Mm-hmm. Part of my team was a data science team. And we were studying all sorts of strains on hospitals. We were trying to prevent hospital ransoms, respond quickly to hospital ransoms. We, after I was hired, Operation Warp Speed was stood up to develop and distribute vaccines, diagnostics, Mm -hmm. therapeutics. We had to identify and buy down risk in the vaccine supply chains. Lots and lots of different work. But one of the things we were studying is we noticed, so this takes a little bit of non-cyber to get to the cyber. Mm -hmm. We saw that when the country hit and this is independent of if you care about COVID or not. And a lot of people are COVID fatigued. Doesn't ma- so what you're saying, doesn't matter how the more people end up in the ICU if more people end up in the ICU. The country's ICUs tend to target about 75% is optimal use of an ICU. 75% of the beds yep. is an optimal use. So over 75% in there tends to be problems. We didn't know. But just... Because just, just you didn't know because we never reached that level We never reached COVID. that level. Yeah, okay. So... What we noticed, and I'll say, I could say this for hours, I'm gonna do the very short version. What my team noticed is when the country hit 500,000 dead Americans in February, Mm -hmm. about a year ago. February 2021. Yep. The CDC also tracks something called excess deaths. And excess deaths are the difference between expected deaths and actual deaths by type, by geography, and by time period. So in other words, we knew how many people, this is very morbid, how many people died normally how many more people died as a result of pick, COVID? Pick a state. Yeah. We know how many people die from heart attacks that month. Yeah. We have very strong models. So excess deaths is the difference between expected and actuals, and it attract all the time. And we know how many people died from COVID, so subtract those. Mm. No? You could do that too, but you want to keep it simple. So what we saw is while the country was tracking that in the headlines, because everyone only cared about COVID, mm-hmm. we were starting to see fairly significant losses of life from non-COVID deaths. And because CISA is, is charged with risk management for critical infrastructure, right? water, but oil and gas, those Higher things. than normal deaths, non-COVID. Right, so they had, this is all public data. People could have been paying attention to it, but not enough people were. So they had published about the same time that there were 150,000 excess deaths mm-hmm. from non-COVID conditions. In, a, in what time span? Same time frame. So uh, the first year of the pandemic, February, year, okay. February, February to February. February. Okay. So I asked my team, we need to study this. Yeah, who are the, who's dying? How did the Who's 100, dying 100. from what? Right. And is there a leading indicator? Because just saying people died is too late. Is there yeah. any way we can reduce the loss of life? Early in the pandemic, and your, your wife's in this business, so mm-hmm. maybe you heard this before, but typically hospitals start failing when there's one of the following three things has a, a constraint or a shortfall. They all start with an S. Staffing, mm-hmm. supplies, space yep so when we tried to flatten the curve early in the pandemic it was not so much staffing problems it, it was, was space space and supplies yeah supplies. we had sure. supply chain problems and we had space problems mm-hmm. so i wanted to see is there anything we can do to reduce the loss of life but one of the reasons i was so terrified and i don't think many people know this so i'm going to say it carefully and slowly when we looked at the 150,000 excess deaths i was not surprised to see that these were time sensitive conditions where minutes matter like heart attacks strokes strokes yep Mm-hmm. diabetes, pulmonary, where minutes or hours or days matter between life and death. Mm-hmm. So they were very prominent in the causes. So this was a matter of delayed degraded care was killing extra people, maybe preventable. But the part- So you looked at the, the cause of yeah, death, yeah. and that cause of death correlated to a condition that needs treatment very quickly. Quickly, time, okay. time sensitive. Time sensitive. Latency sensitive. Yeah, sure. To talk like a techie. So that's one piece, but the part that terrified me is that unlike COVID, where most of the deaths were 65 years old or older Mm -hmm. with four or more comorbidities, these were young people. These were 
the fastest growing demographic by far was 25 to 44 year olds. So 25 to 44 year olds that had a time sensitive condition that yep. needed treatment quickly yep. represented the largest percentage of that 150,000. They were growing the fastest, yeah. In, in the year, so it's 150. In that first year. So it's 150,000 in February 2020 to February 2021. Yep. What was it in the previous year? Did Hardly you any. Okay, okay. So this was noteworthy. Yes. The other part that was, was a spider sense was we were also seeing critical infrastructure workforce shortages that were introducing other problems to the country. Uh, uh, Supplies? The most, the most po- a lot of them were supply chain. Mm. But the one that you'll probably most easily recognize is we had problems with longshoremen in the port of LA getting shipping containers off. Correct. That was not the only one, not even the scariest one, but that was the most publicly covered one. We labeled it as we couldn't get our video cards. Which now or, I or, or now PlayStation I feel like fives or chips. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't build it, my new computer. Which but is but really it was a big deal. So what was on those containers ships mattered. And it wasn't just NVIDIA RTX thirty series cards. No. So I was worried that these excess deaths may be additionally contributing to risk to critical infrastructure performance. And they were Oh, so the op the people who were dying were responsible for keeping our supply chain going sometimes so we studied it now because we know basic data science because we're from the private sector and sure. we're all devopsy people and yeah, yeah, yeah i'm good friends with uh, you know my brother from another mother is bob rudis and like we were just saying i wonder if we can apply some data sciences to see if there's a leading indicator and boy, we found them. So with another public data source, we found that adult ICU bed use mm-hmm. had strong positive correlation, a controlling for state level variables and Poisson models and regression, like really strong correlation. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of voodoo because lots of things contribute to an ICU strain. And, and, and if people never even went to the hospital, they died, not because the hospital was busy, but because they didn't even go. Right. And some people avoided hospitalization. And is that in that 150,000? Yep. Okay. So basically the, the three biggest contributors the first two by far were the bigger ones that we hypothesized and then measured was people delayed trying to go to the hospital because they didn't want to get sick or they were trying to avoid avoid COVID avoid COVID or avoid stressing hospitals. Yeah. Okay. So their self-imposed delay. They didn't want to go to the hospital because they had to wait for a long time. Or they just figured yeah. I'll be fine. Yeah. And they weren't. And there's good numbers that were published around that time period saying for heart and stroke, some of those deaths where people should have gone to the hospital sooner and they, they chose not to. Mm-hmm. The second factor is when they did try, they couldn't get in because some hospitals were at 100% and their people were dying in parking lots. And that's because of COVID. Because the hospitals were full. Because the hospitals were full. They're full. Let's just say they were full. I heard, I heard that, yeah. that cars were lined up. People dying in their cars they waiting were, to get they, in the hospital. They were. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't talk about this on the hero side, but like when I care about bits and bites being flesh and blood, the third thing I cared about, and uh, while I'm a cyber guy, part of my mission was to do star dot star risk, like mm-hmm. all risk. Yeah, sure. So as someone who's a protector, as we discussed, mm. you know, my team and I, we took it on. The people that worked with us, they, they wanted to save lives. They, that's why they went into government. They were mostly non-govies, working mm-hmm. with govies. So, you know, we had a heavy heart for this and we really wanted to figure out, is there anything we can do to save lives? And so we studied it and what we found, um, shouldn't be controversial, um, but in March of last year, we did some data science mm-hmm. and we found that this, that 75% before the pandemic is considered safe and optimal. But during the pandemic- ICU bed yeah, capacity. Yeah. Yeah. During the pandemic, it's fatal. And not just fatal, it's exponentially more fatal the higher over 75% you get. So we oh, modeled it and we measured it. Because and, most of those in these ICU are COVID. No, nope. no. Nope. It was actually the minority of the cases were COVID, but it was enough stress, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah. Doctors and nurses were getting the rules changed all the time. Some mm-hmm. of the COVID patients needed more care. Some of the procedures were changed. A, a whole bunch of reasons. Sure. Many, many reasons we could spend hours going through. But the net result was, whether you liked it or not, the strong correlation was publishable p-values and data science rigor. So we said to HHS and CDC, we have to tell hospitals because they're currently, in good faith, allowing themselves to go to 85%, 95%. They're sending their doctors and nurses to the South when they don't think they need them, but they actually do need them. Oh, I, so regardless of the cause. Re- irrespective of the reason you have yeah. ICU strain, if your ICU goes above 75%, 75% people, people start die. dying. Yeah, okay. And just, I know I you want yeah, okay, like I'm brushing that off, but I'm that, just, I'm trying to understand the math and the, the, yeah. Yeah, in the, in the science, not like trying to downplay the loss of life here. Right, and 
<laughs> there's some irony here in the story too, if we, if I remember, but as we go and we're studying this, I said, we need to warn them that the math has changed so they, they can mercilessly track and limit elective strain on their ICUs because that elective strain mm -hmm. can lead to loss of life of young, healthy individuals. Interesting. Not healthy, younger, there are, treatable words, conditions. There are things hospitals can do to keep at or below that 75% number. Right, there are things like, um, can you afford to take in patients from Texas into your ICU? Sure. If it's gonna put you well above 75%, probably it's, not. It's about patient load, elective yeah. surgeries, is that what you're- Number two is we were giving doctors and nurses away. It's called travelers. Yes. For big bonuses. And you figured, ah, we could, we could spare 10, let's, let's spare 10. But maybe you couldn't actually spare those 10. But if you spare 10, that 75 number drops, 75% drops. No, if you give up your nurses, your total bed capacity now gets dangerous. It affects your bed capacity. Your, your, yeah. your staffed beds. Yeah. And then third is some of the medical procedures that are non-emergency that can result in an ICU mm -hmm. stay. Yeah. You probably can't afford those either. And I'm sure there's great data on which elective procedures result yeah. more than They're likely. not elective all the time because that sounds like a, like a hip replacement. Some something the, that can be postponed. Something that can be postponed. That has a higher likelihood of the patient ending right. up in the ICU should be postponed based on your management of your bed. Yeah, right. I get it. Yeah. It's hospital. People go to school for this. Right. Hospital management. Yeah. Now, when Krebs, you know, we haven't even gotten how I got in there and what we did, but mm -hmm. when Krebs first hired me, he wanted me to break glass. He wanted me to push us outside our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And CISA was born to do cross domain, cross sector risk management. For critical infrastructure. For critical infrastructure, which includes healthcare, mm -hmm. water, oil and gas. So, but CISA was historically uncomfortable because interagency work there's a lot of turf wars and territoriality. Mm. So people are like, why are you doing this? Shouldn't HHS be doing this? But HHS was trying to see, deal with the pandemic. Yeah, politics. And then when we did find it, people at HHS got upset because they're like, why is this in our lane? Um, but the bottom line is the data science was strong. Well-defined or maybe somewhat misunderstood. There's swim lanes in the government For this agencies. country. Yes, for this country in the US. I won't speak for yeah. any other country, but. But yeah. for this country, we have stovepipes yeah. for certain sectors and for the overwhelming majority of our history until the last three years, and when I got there for the, for the first two years, for the la all but the last two years, we had no CISA. So this was new, mm -hmm. and we hadn't figured out how to work together yet. It was a new stovepipe or right. swim lane, yeah. So that's, that's an aside. I'm gonna drop that, because otherwise I'm gonna start getting angry. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to publish this, and in good faith, people were making dangerous decisions that were not robbing Peter to kill Paul, not you, Paul. Uh, but you, yeah, but you were, they didn't you were realize publishing data, not necessarily saying how bad COVID is, how bad comorbidities are, how bad the hospital bed. You were publishing facts to say it wasn't about ransomware necessarily, but all of these things could be factors that I'm sure you put in your report. It basically said hospital management wise, you it, need to be below 75% or below ICU. If you bed. can avoid yeah. exceeding 25%, yes. you should. Yeah. If you can avoid it. Because of reasons you outlined in the report. Right. Yeah. Now, we, this is all internal to government. So where does cyber come in? Because this is what your listeners care about. Yeah. I mean, everyone cares about It was a long way to family. get there, but you, sure. Yeah. yeah. We knew that going into this. So with the cyber part, so if I studied these, and we also, there's other ethnicity breakdowns. Like, it was asymmetrically hitting black and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. So we, we published what this. What do you mean by asymmetrically hitting black and Overwhelming. Hispanics? It, was, it, it was not it, equally it was, distributed across. It race. was favored towards... Adversely affecting black Ad, and Hispanic. It adversely yeah. affected black and Hispanics more than COVID was. No, the excess deaths. Interesting. Yeah. Just excess deaths in general, regardless yeah. of cause. That's in fact, this, the, in our report, we show excluding COVID. Here's the black and Hispanic wow. numbers. So a lot of this is public CDC data, but we're sure. doing analysis yeah. on it. Yeah. So that was in March. So I asked the team the uncomfortable question because we were having record high ransom attacks on hospitals. In fact, the really bad ones, you might remember, were right around the election. Yes. There was a concerted, we, there was a campaign to just, just deliberately disrupt plural U.S. hospitals concurrently just before the election. So basically having all this data, now you're like, how does ransomware that's targeting a healthcare environment impact the death rate? When you're already losing that many people, does, does a ransom attack play a role? 
So we knew that the, it plays a role regardless. Of or course. yeah. Well, here's the simple but version. Worse now because they're of stress from other factors. Let's just stay out of let's stay out of cyber and data science for one second. Sure. Degrade care affects mortality rates. Yes. S a ransom attack introduces delays. It's not that hard. Degrade it. Would you a ransomware degrade delayed and degraded care affects mortality rates. The ransom attacks on the hospitals degraded and affect care. Sure. Delayed and degraded care. So what we said is, I asked the data science team, is there data to show that ransomware is leading to additional loss of life? And my team pursued that mm -hmm. and found the answer was yes. Because I, I think, Josh, the narrative today, largely, is that ransomware doesn't really impact loss of life as much maybe and I, I, and maybe I hope, people would I, say a little but I what hope, you're saying is no i think i hope and i believe we have the goods to show that that's not the case anymore is your report public yes it is now okay it took a long time too long to publish how do we find well we'll talk about that it's in, we'll we can, try and put it's in the show notes, notes. Yeah, okay we'll uh, link but the show notes, yeah. we published a cisa document mm -hmm. uh called provide medical care is in critical condition a cisa insight and we studied many many stresses and strains on healthcare delivery. Mm -hmm. Provide medical care is the term of art for one of our 55 national critical functions, which is when you go to the hospital, can you get care? Mm -hmm. um, we looked at many things, this was one of them, and then we built on it towards the end where we showed how we could measure a state hit hardest by ransomware. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't say which state, but people can guess. That um, absolutely had quantifiable impact because so wait, what you're saying is you looked at this data set that we just described in a number of different ways then looked at the states that had known ransomware attacks their mortality rate was higher all factors being equal in other words yeah, and when you, you look within the state normalize the data yeah, set yeah. and basically states with ransomware more people died better than that in the same state the systems hit because plural health the, systems right, in the, the state. counties or cities to whatever the systems yeah. hit yep. achieved these stress zones sooner and stayed there longer right than their peers in the same state and more people died and we Is know you, yeah you know more people died. So you can yeah separate out now this would not have been possible pre-pandemic because mm -hmm. we Cause sell they were them measuring all these right, things right. pre-pandemic right. yeah. now that's one kind of death and in the report we actually pointed a second kind, which is true forever. It was true before the pandemic, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, and it'll be true after the pandemic. We, we drew concentric rings around a hospital. And basically what we saw is uh, there's a famous, I even cited it on this show, I bet, at some point. There's a famous New England Journal of Medicine article about um, that if you have a heart attack in a U.S. marathon city during a marathon, you have a statistically significant more higher mortality rate after 30 days. So I just said a lot. The 4.4 minutes of the ambulance ride that's longer than normal. Why is it longer than normal? Because roads you have are to closed. go around the roads. Roads are closed yeah. due to the marathon. So they looked at several U.S. cities that have marathons across mm -hmm. several years, and they, it's, it's seminal. It has nothing to do with cybersecurity. But what it had to do with is 4.4 minutes was enough to change the mortality rate for heart attacks. With strokes, oh. different data set, we know there's a thing called the golden hour. Sometimes it's golden hours, one, three, or four, mm -hmm. which is to save time is brain, save there's save your brain functionality and, and save your life right. maybe depending so if you walk again talk again if you survive because you're losing brain cells at an alarming rate so one three or four hours is enough to be a huge difference maker for stroke fatalities because there are procedures that use yes medical imaging technology to break up the blood clot right, in yeah, your brain let's sure. do this for okay. one minute aside and i know a lot about strokes from my mom right? sure there's a lot of kinds of strokes but oversimplified there's two types a rupture where you're bleeding, mm -hmm. it's creating pressure mm -hmm. or a clot, right? If it's a, if you use imaging, thanks to thanks to modern technology, right? If you use imaging, ultrasounds. Right. My wife does a lot of those exams. Sure, if Clots. you can tell it's a clot, yep. we have a miracle drug that will bust the clot and save your brain and save your life. Cum Coumadin? It's not. No, it's not. It's a, there's a class of these, but sure. Coumadin is blood thinner. Yeah, there's a specific treatment that is saved a ton we'll of lives. Break up the clot. Yeah, we'll break up the clot. But if you give that to someone who has a rupture, you'll kill them. Oh. So you have to know. So guess what happens when your imaging systems don't work for most of the You state? can't tell. So people don't get timely care. Or if they get ambulance diverted too far away than one, three, or four hours, they're right. going right. to die. So while wow, we, how fragile the healthcare. And 
my wife's worked in imaging since we were dating. She worked in imaging, right? And wow, how fragile! I never realized how fragile that is. Yeah. She tells me about all the different procedures, advances in technology, the different exams, how people's lives are saved, yeah. how people's lives are lost. But that's a very, it's it's more fragile. It is fragile than I once thought. So if you draw, there's an image in the tail end of the report that shows these concentric rings. Mm -hmm. So when a cyber attack happens or a ransom happens, the first step, the near term damage, which will be there after the pandemic's gone, is that if you're diverted to the next nearest facility and it's too far away, you will see extra death. Sure. The pandemic specific one is a much larger numbers and mm -hmm. that's the one from ICU strain. So what we have learned though, is if you have a ransom attack on a hospital in a city, you'll probably still save the patients. But if you have it in a rural area, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna lose more patients. So this allows HHS or Health and Human Services and CIS and others to post pandemic, we can try to fortify or make sure there's at least alternative care for heart and brain in a geography. Uh, or that if you have only enough staff to help with one of the two ransoms, you help the one that's most geographically isolated. So there's a lot that we can get into and I'll probably stop it there. Is this across the board in the US? Because I think yeah. if we were to ask our audience to raise your hand, if you live in an area where in the news, your local healthcare facility has been hit by ransomware and you've heard of it, whether on the news or whether through word of mouth, a pretty high percentage would raise their hand. I'd raise my hand in Rhode Island. I know that there has been healthcare facilities, major ones that have been hit by ransomware. Mm -hmm. And how long they're down is also a factor. Um, but there's, there's many often disclose that how, because that's a part of this a report. lot of pieces yeah. to that, part. which systems are down yeah. for how long this report has a timeline across five months of when mm -hmm. they were hard down hundred percent, when they got back to 30%, when they got to 70%, but it took months to get back to full capacity. Are imaging systems more critical than some, it sounds like imaging systems are hypercritical. Well, I'll phrase it like this. Some of those deaths are more t time sensitive than less ones, yep. less time sensitive. So a rational risk-based approach would say for the most time sensitive systems, which equipment or people have to function or else we're going to see accelerated loss of life. So it's, those will be brain and heart. I hate, to, I hate to break down loss of life, which is a very emotional thing to data, but you just did really like mm -hmm. you, you can study the data yeah. and come up with a very prescriptive pun intended course of action that would reduce loss of life. It, yeah. in, we're talking about cyber attacks here too. We're talking about independent. When we cost. talk about healthcare, dude, we talk about how they don't have enough budget. They don't have enough staffing, how they can't secure these systems because their legacy mm -hmm. What I hear you saying, maybe not directly, is throw all that crap out the window and we need to put the right resources in the right places to reduce loss of life. If you think of every computer you walk past in a hospital, not all of them have the equal chance to, look, to, to contribute to loss of life. Right. But and I don't know how many of your listeners are ITIL fans. Yeah, sure. But ITIL is about service objects saying this business process is really important. Mm -hmm. So we should secure every system connected to that business process. Now make it patient care. So you're poo pooing point of PCI. It does similar things. Not everything in PCI was wrong. <laughs> okay. You but, heard it here first. I got Josh to say that. Right I said now. that. I said that to <laughs> Mr. Man. You haven't said yeah. it before. You have said, said it. it. You have yeah, said, said it, it before. I should say. Yeah. Okay. But the key here is, especially because most of these hospitals are target rich and cyber poor, they're living yes. below the security poverty line. 85% don't have a single security person on staff, especially these rural ones. What it tells you is if you can't protect everything, the, the systems that are vital, critical path to imaging for, for stroke, mm -hmm. for heart, for lab work, for access to the electronic medical records for their allergies or blood types sure. yes. or their cancer treatments, there was a very profound public study from the University of Vermont mm -hmm. who said this is how our oncology was severely hit by our long ransom outage because mm -hmm. they didn't know cancer how patients treat, didn't know the continue cocktail to treat yeah the, you couldn't yeah, do it right and you if couldn't you're just, getting cancer treatments you have to know where in the stage of treatment you are and I'm not a medical they expert, call it a cocktail yeah, yeah I'm, I'm assuming you need to know what the previous treatment was to know what the current treatment should be right you can't guess no I yeah okay so those people couldn't just go to another hospital to get care because they still need we access didn't know to what the they needed. Yeah. So there's a harrowing. They were very brave to be so transparent, but they were very mm. clear about how that attack hit their cancer treatment. So let me ask you this. Yeah. 
how do we fix the problem? <laughs> There's a lot of lessons implied by the report we published on October 1st, mm -hmm. a lot. There's more that discussion and critical thinking that has to happen right now. All the people that should have those conversations are still busy dealing with these with, with losses COVID. of life. Yeah. yeah, that's another, and not just COVID. It doesn't. It, yeah, there was one yeah, point. Other issues. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues in healthcare. Too. I, I know my wife's been in it for how long, right? And I then I know that's a very narrow view in the grand yeah. scheme of things. But yeah, there are. I mean, yeah. this isn't a healthcare podcast, but there's a lot of issues there. So for the cybersecurity people that just want to talk cybersecurity, I believe the stresses of the pandemic and the elevated admission rates allowed us to better see the system dynamic that was always there. And even when the pandemic's over with, we now are smarter about that system dynamic and armed with that new insight and new system flow, we can make much better, more targeted things. Remember when 9-11 happened? But this happened? requires money. Not necessarily, yes, yes and, not necessarily. Yes. I mean, should we have a bill that funnels money into healthcare? Yeah, there's, and, there, there's going and, to be one. But, because healthcare can you you can't just give them money and have them use it whatever it has to be targeted. money and regulation that they must use it for yeah. cybersecurity. So no. here, here's an analogy. I'm sure there's a better one. When 9/11 happened, mm -hmm. we did a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. including building the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security which eventually turned in and also the Patriot Act. But yeah. yeah, okay, some good stuff and some Whole bad other stuff. podcast, but yeah, <laughs> some very bad stuff. Um, but one of the best things we did, and I hope that we learned to emulate this, is instead of getting rid of all of our airplanes, we did a steel reinforced cockpit door. Mm. That was not bankrupting aviation. We did a steel reinforced cockpit door. So it was very targeted. Very targeted, 80-20 yeah. rule. So I want us yeah. to be similarly targeted on the time sensitive systems in a hospital that can't sure. fail. And I think we can do it. No one's ready to have that conversation right now. The new stress that all of my teammates and HHS and CDC are grappling with now emerged in parallel, which is we have had 10, 20, and 30% losses of the workforce in hospitals. And yeah, that, I mean, that's a whole other part. Uh, what, what do you do? You mandate vaccines? Do you not mandate vaccines? Do you I'm not getting into any of that. Right? right that's a whole. I'm not getting there's into a that. lot of causes of loss of workers. Sure. Lots. And let's leave it at that. There's a lot of causes. But if we're now down to 70% of our nursing staff, for example, during the flu season number two, right? Because we're in the sixth wave, flu mm -hmm. season two, the deadliest wave, there's two things to look at. We have more ICU strain than we did last year mm -hmm. at the same time, and fewer nurses and doctors and surgeons to do it. So that's that, not good. That affects your equation of what right. a safe hospital environment. Basically, you define what a safe operating environment is. And the more strain they're under, the more the burnout rate accelerates. But more importantly, what the factors are to maintaining a safe right, healthcare environment. Cyber being a huge, a huge factor in that, but staffing being one. Remember the three S's at the beginning of the pandemic yeah. between staffing, space, and supplies. Mm -hmm. Our constraints were supplies and space. Mm -hmm. Now we've solved many of the supply problems, not all. Some of them are coming back. Mm -hmm. We had space fixed mostly, but now we're the, the really dangerous part is staffing shortages as they succumb to sickness, death, or, uh, burnout, retirement, mm -hmm. alterations to their family sports structure and the travelers programs and a bunch more I can go into. Sure. But I'm not gonna, not, not for this show because we wanna talk some cyber stuff as well. Um, so these dynamics are not sustainable. And even though everyone's done with COVID, I told my team in July, I'm like, it almost doesn't even matter what the COVID case rates is. Stop looking at that. What matters mm -hmm. is net ICU strain. And we found that John Hopkins has this great chart um, in the, it's not in the report, but it's in public talks we've given, where they show throughout the pandemic, the teal part of the bar is non-COVID ICU beds. Right. And the orange part on top of it is COVID ones. So they fluctuate over time, but COVID's the minority. But what's happened, to use a term that you and I know, you know the term technical debt? Yeah, very well. We have medical. Uh, unfortunately, very well. We have medical procedural debt, and we're upside down. Yes, yes. And what's happening is, yes. this happened to me. I almost should have said it during the heroes part. And not that I'm a hero, but the irony is in July, while I'm desperately trying to publish this to warn people about the pains of degraded delayed care, I was having debilitating pain and I was having degraded delayed care that ultimately ended in a surgery that was almost a really high risk surgery. So Yikes. three members of my team at the same week were hospitalized with degraded delayed care uh, because we couldn't get in. So it, it, these right. deaths started as COVID. They became COVID and non-COVID, and now they're tipping to degraded, delayed, 
technical debt or per delayed My wife debt. witnessed this firsthand. And this is why she put the probe down and be quitting. like, why would you wait? Degraded, delayed care. And we're in a death spiral because if we don't fix mm. it soon, there was a New York Times article about it two weeks ago it's polling healthcare workers, a huge amount of them are intending to leave the profession after flu season. It's, in, oh, it's bad. And it's you can bad. lose them like that, but it takes five, 10, 15 years for certain professions to be replaced. I also think. All right, I know this is a cybersecurity episode. We should, I know, we should stop. I know, we I should know. stop. Okay. <laughs> but but su suffice it to say. Rants, but let's get back, so let's get back to cybersecurity table the healthcare discussion for another time but ransomware kills people is this i mean your you and your team during the pandemic during the pandemic it has killed people and i think that's the big takeaway is that we need and we publish this we need to yeah. fix this problem we need to give healthcare institutions the right resources mm -hmm. and guidance perhaps regulation they're already highly regulated as it is to combat this problem yeah, knock on wood, I hope that when we get on the other side of this endemic and whatnot, mm -hmm. we won't be flirting with 75% or more bed use. But what we at least showed them is, can you measure the re relationship between hospital strain and excess deaths? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So I think we can make smarter decisions. There's already a COVID commission being formed, mm -hmm. just like the 9-11 commission. And um, people like myself and our team and some of the things we published inside government will feed, what do you do next? Right. And some of them we like cash for clunkers, like for some of these really old vulnerable systems that are just unsafe at any speed, we may do a stimulus package to update them to more modern tech. That's a positive thing. I've not heard that before and I like that a lot. Just hearing it without really processing it in my brain, I do like that a lot. So I'll-, I'll Because legacy kills yeah. us. Yeah, I will- Literally, I mean literally- Legacy kills. Legacy kills. Yeah. Now let's pivot hard to cyber again. Mm -hmm. um, even though people don't know I did this or my team did this, um, while we were so <laughs> the the very short version of how krebs recruited me and the rest of us is i told them during rsa i expect a high, higher volume and variety of ransom attacks on hospitals let me brief your team so that you can be prepared a couple weeks later he calls and i'm like you ready for that briefing and he says uh actually no i'd like you to serve your country for a year and i'm like huh i'm a philosopher and a hacker i don't belong in a federal bureaucracy i mean we play spot the fed i don't want to be the fed mm -hmm. but like when he told me what they wanted to do is that hospitals are getting hit hard. Team um, uh, CTI League, Cyber Threat Intelligence League was helping hospitals. Mm -hmm. Cavalry was helping, some other groups were helping. So he said, we got Congress to approve direct hires of hackers and others, can you come in? So they made me the chief strategist. We were able to design and implement what became a CISA COVID task force with 100 plus people mm -hmm. at our peak and then down to like, I don't know, 20 towards the end. And we had a, we formed the Avengers. We had mm. complementary skills, including infectious disease experts and other things. And we were supposed to identify and buy down risk for hospitals, 85% of which don't have a single security person on staff. So they're, yeah. they're, they're below the poverty line. But number two, while I was being onboarded, because it took five months, Operation Warp Speed was, was announced. And we were assigned the security and assurance for anything in the vaccine supply chains. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them were huge, like Merck and Pfizer. But some are super tiny that you've never heard of. They've been in existence for two years, and they, they're the only manufacturer in the world of this one thing. Yeah, that, that they need, need for either a test or a vaccine, right? Because I'm sure it's not just vaccines, tests as well. It was vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics, and tests. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, because we still can't get antivirals to enough people today. There's there's so many things yeah. that we were running short. My wife on. just had COVID, and she literally could not get prescribed an antiviral. And she works on the front lines in a healthcare facility. Well, early on, this was also personal protective equipment, PPE. Yes. There's a lot of things in the supply chain. So we did both. And what I noticed quickly, I took my SBOM. This mm -hmm. is like life going full circle. When I was pushing SBOM into federal government and then eventually into NTIA and eventually mm -hmm. now into the executive order, I was studying history from World War II. Mm -hmm. Ball bearings. They bombed the ball bearings factories for the Germans because all the water fighting disease, uh, equipment needed ball bearings. Oh, so I called this yep. the ball bearing strategy. And what we found was who are the small, unguarded, vital links in the supply chain? Right. And every time we met one, they had zero security people. The one that scared me the most, the proof of my hypothesis for ball bearings. So this is supply chain risk analysis being applied to life and death. Right. And also World War II history, which yeah. when you get to our age, you're either going to barbecue meat or be enamored with World War II history or both. <laughs> 
Yes. So I studied Deming. All that happens at 32, folks, by the way. Um, <laughs> exactly 32. I'm still 32 <laughs> two years later. Um, so I took this stuff I learned from Deming, Toyota supply chain stuff, from World mm -hmm. War II ball bearings, precision bombing, from other stuff, and we applied it to the vaccine supply chains. And without naming which one it was, the one I was up at night over, um, they had three IT people, zero security people. You could have sneezed on them, and we would have had no Pfizer or Moderna. Gone. Uh, so when uh, I yeah. zoomed out to cyber, back to cyber, Sis is holding a hammer. Everything looks like a cyber nail. So we have a bunch of free services for these people. Some services are easy to take. Like, can we do a cyber hygiene scan of your external web addresses? Sure. Yeah, give yeah. you a daily report. Some of them are very advanced. You would need a team to digest mm -hmm. and act upon them. And some of them are things like threat hunting or incident response. So here's the key. And I think your listeners probably heard of this and didn't know where it came from. I said, you know what's the, the common link here between hospitals that 85% don't have a single security person, these vaccine supply chain ball bearings, and the successful hacks of water treatment facilities, mm -hmm. meat packing facilities, they're all target rich, cyber poor. Yep. And what I mean by cyber poor, insufficient information, incentives, or resources. Yep. So on the resources thing, I said, I got really angry during the exchange attacks, Microsoft mm -hmm. Exchange, because Bob Rudis scanned the whole internet and found that the most prominent version of exchange on the internet is unsupported. Mm. And I was swearing a lot. Mm -hmm. And most of them were in hospitals and critical infrastructure. <sighs> so I'm like, why are we talking about implement zero trust or do best practices? Screw this. So we implemented sysa.gov slash bad practices. And I named three practices that are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we put it harshly. And everyone's like, but Josh, aren't these common? I said, yes, they're common. And, and go dangerous. Away. Like unsupported software. Yeah. So one is the use of unsupported software in mm -hmm. service of critical infrastructure and national critical functions is dangerous. This dangerous practice is especially egregious in internet facing technologies. Number two was same thing for password, hard coded passwords. How do, you, how do you get the people to know that they're in violation of number one? So step, some people don't, when you talk about that supply chain mm -hmm. link, that they don't know. So I just wanted in my tenure at CISA to put a stake in the ground mm -hmm. such that insurers would maybe make this uninsurable, that regulators would maybe regulate those to bad raise practices the visibility. out of yeah. So they wouldn't it's necessarily help during Indirectly the Indirectly raising the visibility, yeah. yeah. And that we could try to target that before you fall for some snake oil or a rock star speech at a conference, Don't do these things three. Don't run unsupported software. Yeah. Hard-coded passwords. Multi-factor authentication or whatever, yeah. You can read the three right now. There's going to yeah. be a fourth one shortly. But we want less than 10, and we want them to be the negligence. Yes. Line. We couldn't say negligence, but we said They're the things we've talked about on the forever. show for 16 years, dude. Yeah. But the standard you walk past is the standard you endorse. So step one was that. Step two, we made this thing called SOS. I teach my students at CMU. I have mm -hmm. a different acronym for SOS <laughs> to get your shit off show, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, but for the federal government, we had to call it get your stuff off search. So we published a really simple graphic and tutorial on how mm -hmm. to use census IO, show Dan, thingly to identify. Your, we said your assets are showing. Yeah. See what your adversaries can see. So if you don't have a budget, let's meet them where they are, identify them by down risk for free, and then have a pragmatic walkway to do crawl, walk, run. Mm -hmm. So we did bad practices, stuff off search. We started issuing really free lightweight tabletop crisis simulations. Mm -hmm. So I just got mad at this just do best practices crap. And we started doing things that were fit for purpose for most of the targets in Operation Warp Speed or most of the targets in hospitals or water treatment facilities or the like. And it doesn't mean we're going to save the world and it's not enough. But if that's the difference between another multi-week, multi-month outage in a hospital environment, no hospital should go down because of one of those bad practices. None. Mm -hmm. And then when we layered in, I think you'll like this one too. I, I can't, I, I won't take credit for this was a team effort, but one of the, the concurrent things that we availed ourselves of is CISA and NSA and a couple others started pushing this known exploited vulnerabilities list. Of course, I'm sure you've covered it, but the KEV. Yeah, this was, uh, was it NSA that published this list? It's CISA. No. CISA, okay. Yeah, but yeah. it was initially fed by uh, Partnership. And I think what, we have, co yeah. there's a couple of lists that have come out, like if you've got these vulnerabilities associated with these CVEs, yeah. you're screwed, you should patch them. So this idea of like, let's patch just based on CVSS score, which is nearly meaningless. Um, I think you know this from other, my HD Moore's Law stuff or what uh, Kenna eventually did with the, um, the, the, uh, E EPSS, Exploit mm -hmm. Probability yep. Scoring System. Yep. Yep. Um, this is the idea that let 3% or so, 3% of exploits ever get exploited. You should probably start there. They get exploited on a, I would say, a mass basis. 
Yeah, the, the, there's, the, right. But if you know there's, there's an ubiquity yeah. to them. It doesn't mean that if you do them, you're safe. But what it meant was if you're a target if race cyber don't poor, do them, you're screwed. Right. Yeah. So we that, said I agree. there's a lot of nuances there, but yeah. yeah, that I can get behind. So if you're this three people making the only the only manufacturer of this thing, patch these down. Yeah. Scan for your stuff off search. Right. Patch the ones that are on the known vulnerability, known exploited vulnerabilities list, and stay vigilant for things like the next log for J. But like, if you have very limited resources, this is the stuff that you should focus on. And it doesn't mean I'm right. It just means we're in a look at this as a war. This is battlefield triage. It is raising the bar. It is. It is. It, but see, I think we pontificate and we debate it in cybersecurity, and the message gets lost. Because mm -hmm. in that message, I think we've been consistent on the show and saying that like. Yeah, you need to do some of these basic things. A lot of other stuff to do, but if you do these basic things, you're in much better shape. Right. And look, I, I've lost track of time, so I won't yeah, say much we're, more. We're on coming this. up on time. Yeah. Yes. But if you zoom out, while I was focused on healthcare and vaccine supply chains, which included a lot of these target rich cyber poor, in parallel, mm -hmm. you saw that for most critical infrastructure, it's privately owned and operated, they don't have a CISO or a security staff. So they're all living below Wendy's security poverty line. Right. And if we really want to get serious about keeping the country safe, especially if we start seeing elevated collateral damage from a Ukrainian conflict with Russia, mm. like we saw with NotPetya, that did damage the U.S. even though it wasn't the intended target. Like we are prone, we're prey, and now the predators have taken notice. And there's a lot more. You love more. the P word. So I yeah. do like alliteration and consonants. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of being an effective policy whisperer. Um, <laughs> Short lists, ideally with consonants and alliteration, and it's very catchy prolific. phrases like "target rich cyber poor." <laughs> and now you're just taking a piss. <laughs> uh, so the, these things, um, we can talk about advanced things and look at how great our you know elaborate hack is. But if we are living in this country or living in this world, and the critical infrastructure our families depend upon is increasingly targeted, some subset of us need to get very practical and pragmatic on buying down 80 20 rule risk for now and then get them on a path to crawl walk run towards best practices i want you to answer the five questions what are the five questions three words to describe yourself <laughs> they have to all be peace by the way in your case protector passionate protector and puzzler if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice Uh, a tool that can identify something like a showdown. If you were to book about yourself, what would the title be? I have no idea what I'm doing, but it seems to be working. What is your favorite hacker movie? Oh, that's a tough one. It's, it's either sneakers or war games because of Joshua. I mean, war games was the first one I saw. So let's go with war games. Choose two celebrities to be your parents alive, fictional, dead or otherwise. Wow, I don't know this question. And one has to be from Marvel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, There's think, no right or wrong answers, Josh. I think so. Morgan Freeman would make a good dad. If he could narrate my life, that would be awesome. <laughs> I think he'd make a good dad. Jeez, uh, I don't know. For a mom, I had the greatest mom There's ever. a man. He's a protector. <laughs> <laughs> He's my son. Uh <laughs> Mom know. is the tough one. It is a tough one. Males struggle identifying a celebrity mom or a, any kind of mom that is not their own, which is really coming full circle to mm. many aspects of our interview. Right. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say the one I had. <laughs> not a celebrity, but... I think uh, that's extremely genuine, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think all the things you've said... Across the Hacker Heroes interview and this one is very genuine. I, I, I think I was always an authentic person, but I think when you see, when you have losses like we've had, mm. and when you have, you know, I went from that imposter syndrome, you know, hacker sidekick to like realizing that what we do matters. And as you step into that, you don't get arrogant about it. But I love this quote, um, humility isn't thinking less about yourself it's thinking about yourself less. Yeah. And so I've come to like understand the responsibilities we bear and I'm I'm so I'm less shy about just being authentic cuz if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be wrong. Let's talk about it. Make me less wrong. Yeah. But 
if I we aren't authentic. Of that today. Yeah. That's an important aspect of yeah. today where you can be wrong and we can talk about it. Now I'm if wrong you're all wrong, the time. now if yeah. you're wrong, you're canceled. And I yeah. think that's a shame. Yeah, I am worried about, there's a, another quote I like from during the pandemic, um, but it's a, it's a documentary, documentary filmmaker who said, um, tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance. And like, yes. And uh, oh my God, we've lost yes. nuance in a lot of cases. But, yes. And look, I'm, I'm all sorts of messed up from this public service. It was very hard. We had a lot of friendly fire. We had a lot of gatekeeping. A lot of people were uncomfortable with us doing things that were atypical. We had a lot of losses, things I wanted to do that we couldn't do. We also had a lot of huge successes and we definitely saved lives, including like dry ice supply chain problems during their initial yeah. rollout. Like, yeah. But so it was high highs and really devastating lows. And on the other side of this, there's a couple of things I want to take away. I'm still in my healing process six mm. weeks out, five weeks out. But what I realized is I may not just be a cyber guy anymore. I, I think some of the most profound things the team did we had no business doing, we wouldn't have the confidence to do, but we had to do it because mm -hmm. no one else was doing it and it worked. So I, I kind of feel like I'm an intersectional risk guy. And I think cybersecurity, whether we realize it or not, prepares us for really difficult dynamic risk management. But I think we need more people like you that can step outside of that, not so much ego, but that persona of going, I'm a cyber person. And maybe I'm a cyber person, but I'm also going to play in this other space and I'm going to straddle both sides of it. I think we yeah. need more people like that. Yeah. So as I try to pick my next job, some of the options are intersectional risk, including yeah. cyber. Some of them are going back to cyber, which is incredibly, increasingly important. Sure. And yes, I'm saying cyber, but I'm also drinking, so it's okay. Probably pays more too, but I mean, there's it probably the pays profit more. is a P that you shouldn't necessarily ignore. So... I'm still in the throes of that, but what I do realize is, and I, what I want everyone listening to, to hear is, our talent pool has more value to add than we realize mm -hmm. on issues that aren't even directly related to cyber. And sometimes the best way to convince people to invest in the cybersecurity is by also factoring their clinical risks and their staffing risks and their supply chain risks and it's safety into I context. Think what we're passionate they about see is, it. is hacking, but also safety. Safety is a huge factor. Yeah, and um, regardless of what I do next, um, I really hope that the people that listen to your Heroes podcast, or the people that listen to Security Weekly, that are worried about what they're seeing going on, don't be a spectator. Mm -hmm. Like Your skills are applicable for your wastewater treatment facility, for the hospital in your neighborhood, for the municipalities. Your skills are useful to help nudge illiterate policy to be more literate policy. And things are gonna change after all this. We're already seeing like breach notification laws and other mandatory minimums. And this can't be a spectator sport. And um, so many of us that aren't the the, the anointed Digerati rock star culture class um, have imposter syndrome. And I'm hoping people shed the imposter syndrome and apply their skills to protect the world, but also to protect the people in their care, their loved ones, because the timely medical care might be for you or someone in your family. And um, it's going to get worse. I don't know if you saw the, the Gossy the Dog stuff. You know, it's, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better on the, this critical infrastructure attacks. And it'll take years to drain the swamp on the legacy and a lot of uncomfortable political will. Um, but some of us are smart enough and talented enough to apply our skills, not just to the hobby, not just to our profession, but maybe also to the public good. And uh, hopefully I've created a space for the cavalry where people can directly help there. And we're also seeing things like the cavalry emerge. And just like lawyers have pro bono and do things for free mm -hmm. or in areas that might affect the greater good, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that our teammates and our colleagues as they shed the exhaustion from two years of pandemic can can lend a hand because people need our skills josh corman thank you so much for appearing on paul security weekly thank you for having me with that we'll conclude the show thank you everyone for listening and watching we'll see you next time over and out